Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Butterfield. I'm the director of the library at Mount Vernon. I'm coming to you from my home, welcoming you to a conversation with historian Colin Calloway, author of an important recent book on George Washington that we'll explore across the next, ha uh, next hour. Uh, for about a half an hour, I'll ask him questions. Uh, and then following that, you'll have an opportunity uh, by questions that you're posting uh, online uh, to ask him your questions about George Washington, about Native America in the 18th century, about why he wrote this book, uh, although I may get to that question first. Uh, excited to have this conversation. I do wanna say a quick uh, uh, note about some upcoming events uh, that we have in the near future. Um, on uh, Thursday of next week, uh, so uh, a week from this Thursday, May 21st, Tim Breen, historian, will be joining us to talk about his new book, The Will of the People. Uh, this will be actually our third of three Michelle Smith lectures. Uh, excited to have uh, Tim Breen joining us virtually uh, from his home. And uh, we also have on Thursday, so this Thursday, the following Thursday, an exciting new event, uh, Trivia Thursdays uh, with the Mount Vernon folks. Um, we played last week, myself, uh, the president, uh, Doug Bradburn, and the head of uh, Historic Preservation and Collections, Susan Schulwer, happy to say that I won, uh, and I'm excited to try to defend my title this Thursday. Uh, but of course, we have daily live streams uh, across uh, the weekdays, Monday through Friday, in the noon hour. Uh, and beginning just this past week, uh, we're starting a member exclusive series on Monday nights. Uh, so the, on the past uh, Monday, so just two, uh, uh, yesterday, that would be uh, historian Joseph Ellis joined Doug Bradburn in conversation. Uh, this coming Monday, we'll have Martha Washington, uh, a historical interpreter, of course, uh, joining you. And the following Monday, Memorial Day, Rick Atkinson will be joining us to talk about his work on the American Revolutionary War. Uh, but as you can see, these are members ex, uh, exclusive events, uh, members only live streams. You have an opportunity to join from around the world, uh, become a member of Mount Vernon and uh, interact uh, with us in these uh, great events. Uh, but now I have the great opportunity to have a conversation with Colin Calloway, who comes to us uh, from Dartmouth College. Uh, I don't I don't think you're currently in your office, Colin, but uh, he is a professor of history and Native American studies there and the author of this important new book, uh, The Indian World of George Washington. Uh, and uh, Colin, I want to start with a very simple question. Um, you came to Mount Vernon and worked on this book. Uh, I know that you've worked hard on it across years. It's a, a, a culmination in, in a lot of ways of work that you've been doing on 18th century Native American history. Uh, what do you want people to take away uh, from this, this pairing of George Washington and a story of Native Americans uh, across uh, many decades of the 18th century? Uh, why did you write this book? Yeah, thank you, Kevin. Good evening, everybody. I'm actually coming to you from Vermont, where I live, and where it snowed on Saturday. Wow. Uh, so, um, but this, probably this is not the audience to make this confession to, but I, I never really was intending to write a book about George Washington. I've spent my life studying Native American history, and one of the things that I and people like me have always struggled with. It's a question of how do you get American Indians into American history in a meaningful way? And it struck me that George Washington was the, the perfect vehicle to do that. Um, you know, maybe the most famous person in American history, the founding father. If I could show that Native Americans mattered in the life of George Washington and in the nation that he created, I could I could accomplish some of that that task. Um, so, and when we look at his presidency, I, I know let's let's kind of stay in the latter years of his life. Uh, obviously, Native Americans were an important part of his presidency uh, from beginning to end. Uh, there's an, an important uh, a challenge uh, that uh, Washington faces almost on a daily basis that comes from the the, the ways that white Americans are interacting with Native Americans. Yeah. Um, sorry, I lost everybody for a moment there. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was I, asking about his presidency. I, no, you, I got, I, clearly, I got there's the a audio. daily uh, significance to his uh, interactions with Native Americans. I've, I've actually been working on a book recently on Native American delegations to early American cities, in particular to Philadelphia. And I, I kind of came to that out of this book because in Washington's presidency, Indian delegations to Philadelphia were kind of commonplace. There were a lot mm -hmm. of them. Uh, this image that you're seeing is an engraving uh, by William Birch, and it shows a delegation of probably 
Iroquois or Haudenosaunee um, Sir James being given a tour of Philadelphia. And John Adams at one point writes that, this is in the mid 1790s, that the previous week, George Washington had had dinner with four different Indian delegations on four different days. And I, as I'm fond of saying, he did that not because he liked having Indians over for dinner, but because he understood that his infant republic was still weak and that Native American nations, despite the hammering that they'd taken uh, over the previous generations, were still powerful and still mattered in, it could still affect the, the future of the new nation. It's fascinating. Uh, in fact, this image is almost a, a, is, is, it's almost like a photograph uh, from the mm -hmm. moment. This, uh, where does this come from, this, this particular image? Uh, William Birch engravings of, I think it, it, it's of Philadelphia, it's published in uh, 1800. Mm -hmm. This is a, we've zeroed in on a, on a larger image. Remarkable, yeah. Uh, so actually, I, I, I think I made brief reference to the fact that you came to Mount Vernon to work on this uh, mm -hmm. uh, book in, in some ways. Uh, I, I should mention that uh, this, this event, this opportunity for you and, you and I to talk uh, is um, sponsored by the, the Ford Motor Company, but the Mount Vernon Ladies Association is, of course, uh, undergirding everything that we did. Uh, how long uh, were you able to come in as a Mount Vernon uh, 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 research fellow? Uh, how long did you spend working at our library? Um, it was broken up because I have another life here in Vermont, but um, the the fellowship that I, I got was the, the Reese Fellowship, which is six mm -hmm. months, and I think I was there probably in total about four and a half. Um, but the main stint that I did was in the fall of 2016, um, and I had a pretty monastic existence while I was there, but it's a great opportunity for somebody like me because get up at seven o'clock in the morning, there's nobody around, you walk over to the library, and you can stay there as long as you like. Um, and so I'd never had a, an opportunity like that before. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, let's let's walk through a, a bit of the of the story that you explored. Then, um, it, when we go back to the, to the earliest days of, of Washington's life, in fact, he enters the the world stage in something uh, typically called the French and Indian War. Uh, so, t can you talk to me a little bit about Washington's um, starting point? Uh, how does he uh, first interact with Native Americans? What sort of uh, learning curve is he on as he uh, enters into uh, the world in, in the 70, as an adult in the 1750s. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I make, points that I make in the book, that Washington is always interested in Western land. And the yes. Western land, of course, is Indian land. Um, although he doesn't usually use that, that, that descriptor. So as a young man surveying, surveying in the West, he's looking West. And also as a Virginian, he's looking west because Virginia is uh, has west claims to the Ohio Valley. It's looking west, and then as president, of course, he's looking west as the as the leader of an, an expansive uh, nation. Um, but his first uh, real exposure, I think, to Native American politics and diplomacy and culture and warfare comes in the. Um, at the beginning of the French and Indian War, and in fact, he's often credited with starting the French and Indian War, uh, because he's sent as an, uh, if you like, an emissary by the governor of Virginia to ask the French, who were laying claim to the Ohio country and building forts there, if, if they wouldn't mind leaving, because this country belongs to King George. And of course, yeah. the French reply, thanks, but no thanks, this country belongs to King Louis. In fact, in many ways, and this is a point that I make, it belongs to the Indians. But there are different groups of Indians in that area. The, there are Shawnees, Delawares, Wyandots, etc. And the Iroquois Confederacy, the League of the Six Nations, also lays, lays claim to that uh, territory. And that means that they have in position there a person with the title of the half king, which is like an ambassador or a, like a vice regent, whose name is Tanarison. And this is the guy that gives George Washington his real introduction to 
the kind of treacherous waters of, of Indian politics and intertribal diplomacy in the Ohio Valley. So what are some of the things that Washington learns in those early years that shape who he becomes later? Yeah, well, there's a rather grisly account in the book of, of the um, of the skirmish with the French at Jumonville Glen, um, which uh, I'll, I'll set to one side. One of the things that fascinates me as a, as a Native American history nut is um, what I call wampum diplomacy or the language of wampum diplomacy and how important these strings and belts of um, beaded marine shells arranged in patterns that contain messages and, and symbols are to the conduct of, of diplomacy. And Washington's a kid. Right? He, there's no way he could have fully understood the intricacies and the protocols and the language of these belts. But in his journal, he talks about them, he refers to them, because Tenarison says, we have to wait for the Shawnee belt and we have to wait for the Delaware belt before we can proceed. And Washington's getting frustrated. He thinks he's been given the runaround because he's in a hurry to get mm. to, the, to the French officers. He actually is being given the runaround, um, but it's a little more complicated than that. Tenarison wants, for his own reasons mainly, to sever the alliance with, with the French. To do that, he has to return to the French the wampum belt of alliance that has been exchanged when that alliance was formed. Tenarison's ready to do that, and he wants the Shawnees and the Delawares to follow suit and do that as well. The Shawnees and the Delawares, however, are kind of asserting their independence from these Iroquois claims of uh, hegemony, and they're dragging their feet. They're not sure that they want to sever this French alliance, especially since the French are uh, putting on this impressive display of uh, military power. Because if a war is going to be fought, it's going to be fought in their backyard. So Washington sort of has the um, sense of what's going on, but he's not really sure why. And that's what's going on, because these wampum belts are essential. You can't make an alliance without them. You can't break an alliance without them. And does, Washington, does Washington learn this by the end of the war? He, he, I, he gets it by the end of the war. And by the time when of his presidency, when we're talking about those delegates coming to Philadelphia, he's not only having them to dinner, but he's exchanging wampum belts with them. Right? This is part of what you have to learn to do business in Indian country and with Native American diplomats. Well, so much of what we know about Washington, uh, it comes uh, in, in, in the biographical sense of, of this, this progression from a uh, a rash and, and adventuresome man who, who, who mellows later in life. Uh, it, I think it's uh, it's fascinating for me to also think about the lessons that he's learning uh, in how to interact with different kinds of people in the 1750s, uh, rather than just coming to terms with himself, right? Which is normally how biographers write this. He's right. he also seems to be coming to terms with with, with interactions with with other peoples. Um, of course, the 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 culmination of of this. Uh, uh, the story from the French and Indian War, at least as I used to teach it in the history survey, is the coming of the revolution. Uh, and you describe part of the challenge uh, that's presented by the outcome of the war um, uh, that uh, then becomes this, this ongoing thing that Washington has to engage with, and that is how to limit expansion, uh, the expansion of white settlement. Could you talk to us a little bit about the outcome of, of the Seven Years' War and, and how that sets the stage for everything Washington deals with from then on? Yeah, and of course, Washington is involved in some of the major campaigns of the Seven Years' War, uh, at least in the Virginia, Pennsylvania frontier before the war shifts north. He's with Edward Braddock when the British army is destroyed at the forks of the Monongahela in 1755. And then he's with General John Forbes, who takes an army with the same objective of seizing the French fort at Fort Duquesne, what is now uh, Pittsburgh, uh, and succeeds. And Forbes succeeds really without firing a shot virtually because he recognizes the realities of uh, the West. And that is that the French may have forts in Indian country, 
that those forts, even Fort Duquesne, depend for their defence upon Indian allies outside the walls rather than on French firepower within the walls. Hmm. And so Forbes, through a series of proxies and surrogates, gets involved in a very complicated diplomacy that brings 500 Indian people from 13 different nations to a treaty at Eastern Pennsylvania in 1758, where the British essentially, to simplify it, say, once we kick out the French, your lands will be safe, will be protected. And that's why the Indians were fighting in the war, not because they were pawns of the French. And with that treaty achieved, the Shawnees and the Delaware say, okay, mission accomplished for us, the war is over. Hmm. They step aside, which gives the British army under Forbes the green light to advance to Fort Duquesne. The French abandon it, blow it up, uh, because they know it's untenable. Three years later, I mean, five years later, after the British have captured Montreal, Quebec, at the Peace of Paris, France cedes to Britain its North American empire. And so now Britain has an empire beyond its wildest dreams. It's what it's hoped for for 80 years, get the French out of North America. And has in acquired this huge empire um, and doesn't really know what to do with it. Right? Um, but the Brits make two major mistakes. Uh, <clears throat> they're both, I think, tied to Indians. Um, first thing they do is kind of forget and break the promises that they've made to Indians. That results in a what's often called an uprising called Pontiac's Revolt. I prefer to call it the First American War of Independence, where the Indians of the Great Lakes and the Ohio Valley do what the American colonists do 12 years later. They take on the British Empire and they give the British a bloody nose. Um, so the British think, okay, how are we gonna deal with this? One thing we've got to do, we realize now, is to keep an army a standing army in America. And that's 10,000 men. That's a lot of money. How are we going to pay for that? So some bright spark in London comes up with the idea, hey, let's tax the American colonists, right? Because the army is there for their defense. And we all know where that went, right? That's the strand that gets all the attention in American history books. The other piece of it is what you see on the screen. The Brits understand that as long as Western settlement, as long as British subjects are allowed and free to settle on Indian land, there's going to be conflict, there's going to be trespass, there's going to be bloodshed, and wars are expensive and uncertain, etc. So how are we going to curtail that? And the British answer is that the expansion of Euro-American population that's going to be inevitable has to be regulated. And we will do that by trying to control it from the center. The American government will try and do this in the 19th century <clears throat> with similar lack of success. In October 1763, the British government offers what they call the Royal Proclamation. And it has a number of aspects to it, but the fundamental one is that it basically takes the Appalachian Mountains, the chain of the, the spine of the Appalachian Mountains, says east of that is British territory, British settlement. West of that to the Mississippi is also British territory, but it's reserved for Indians. And the only people who can go there are traders and agents authorized by the crown. And the only people who can buy land from Indians <coughs> are the duly authorized agents of the crown. We can't just have anybody settling there, uh, cheating Indians out of lands, etc. In London, that makes sense. In Virginia, this is a bombshell because many of the people who are household names as the founding fathers have been doing what was fairly standard practice 
in the American colonies in the middle of the 18th century, investing in Western lands in expectation of the day when the French would be defeated, the Indians would not have French allies, and British settlers would swarm over the mountains looking for land to buy and to rent, and those who had invested in those Western lands would make a killing selling and renting the land to was, was Washington. Washington, Washington is one of the, he's up to his ears in land settlement, in land investment. Right? Yeah, so yeah. this is a major factor in alienating Washington from his allegiance to the crown because he had fought and sacrificed and suffered in the French and Indian War as a British subject. He's now really questioning the value of that. So when we go into the to the revolution then uh, and and think about uh, what Washington is is thinking about in in the, in those moments, some of the the lessons that he learned in the French and Indian War, um, it, it, the, the military strategy, all those things that we often talk about. Uh, there's also this other uh, element here, then, isn't there? Uh, coming out of the French and Indian War, he would have had a a sense of of these Western lands and and a, and a real personal stake in holding on to them. And that, that 1763 proclamation would have undercut that. It sounds Absolutely. to me. Absolutely. I always say that Washington, even though most he lives his life in the East, most of it, he's always looking West. And when the revolution happens, it is, of course, a war for American independence, but it's also a war for Indian land. For American Indians, it's a war for their land but it's also a war for their independence because they recognize that if the Americans win, it's gonna be open season on Indian land. The, the majority of, American, of Native Americans who fight in the revolution fight for the British, but they don't do that out of any sort of blind loyalty to King George. <clears throat> the British, because of the proclamation, at least have some record of trying to protect and limit expansion onto Indian land, who are they yeah. trying to protect those lands from? American colonists, right? Yeah. So Indians know what's gonna happen. Well, we wanna talk about George Washington, but also I, I wanna get, take an opportunity to explore some of the, the Native American characters mm -hmm. that you uh, deal with in, in the book. Uh, there's one that's on the cover with Washington uh, yeah. that I think is an important uh, element, both of the revolution and of, of the years to follow. Uh, could you tell us about who this is? Yeah, this is a, a, a uh, a Seneca, a war chief. The Senecas are the westernmost nation of the six nations of the Iroquois. So it's Mohawks, Oneidas, Onondagas, Cayugas, Senecas, and the Tuscaroras who become the six nation are kind of tucked in uh, next to the Oneidas. Um, during the American Revolution, Corn Planter fights against the Americans. He fights as an ally of the British. Um, after the American Revolution, when the, the, uh, the British have uh, recognized American independence and then transferred that same land that the French transferred to the British in 1763, the British transfer that land to the Americans in 1783, which leaves the Americans to then go into Indian country with the argument and taking the stand that the Indians have already lost their land. That corn planter and other Indians who fought with the British chose the wrong side. The British had transferred their land to the United States. And so now the United States is coming to the Indian tribes to give them peace. And they're not only giving them peace, they're going to allow them to continue living on a portion of their land but it's only out of the goodness of their hearts that they're, they're doing that. Um, for the Iroquois, <clears throat> that treaty is the Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1784. <clears throat> Corn planter is at that treaty. And this is a notorious treaty in Iroquois Haudenosaunee history because mm -hmm. the delegates there agree to this confiscation almost, if you like, of Iroquois land. Uh, and Corn Planter takes a lot of flack for that. Uh, in 1790, 
uh, when he visits Washington in Philadelphia, he says, you know, this was a, you made us, we, we were made to say things we should, didn't want to say. But from that point onwards, he charts a new, if you like, direction and career as a Seneca chief in which he's now dealing with the Americans, mending fences with the Americans, eventually um, advocating a new path for his people toward adopting American uh, civilization. And it's a very controversial stance for him to take and uh, costs him, uh, it causes controversy and uh, divisiveness among his own people. But that's what's going on in Indian country in the wake mm -hmm. of the American Revolution. Well, I've got a, a couple more questions that I want to ask you, but I want to remind everyone who's watching now uh, that uh, you are able to to ask questions of Professor Calloway as well. Uh, so please post them. Uh, we'll be coming in uh, shortly to to ask some of those questions. Um, but I, there's an, another map. In, in talking to you ahead of time, we talked about the the landscape that Washington would have seen um, both coming out of the Seven Years' War and then coming out of the American Revolution. Uh, of course, he doesn't quite know in the mid 1780s that he's uh, soon going to be uh, leading, as you mentioned, the, this infant republic. Uh, but of course, he's keeping uh, a watchful eye on what's uh, um, uh, being made of this this moment in the mid 1780s. Uh, and one of the things that, that uh, again, when I used to teach the survey that was often described as, as an important um, turning point in American history is what to do with these Western lands, uh, this famous Northwest Ordinance of, of mm -hmm. 1787. Uh, I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about this uh, this landscape that Washington would have seen uh, in the 1780s, and, and again, uh, then as he's coming in as president in 89. Yeah. What so should we what, be looking at here? Yeah, so what we're, I'm gonna focus on is this little mustard colored area marked the Northwest Territory. But one of the things I think we have to remember is that neither Washington nor anyone else would have really seen the continent of North America as we see it either on a map like this or on a current map or in our own minds that it's kind of preordained that it will become American. Right? Hmm. He would have looked west, he did look west, and he would have seen maybe a continent divided up between rival empires, maybe with Spain and maybe Britain still holding some areas. Uh, powerful Indian nations, etc. There was no guarantee that it was going to turn out the way that it did. Um, but one of the reasons why it does, I think, is because of the Northwest Ordinance, which Congress passes in 1787. Uh, and you're right, Kevin, that Washington doesn't stop thinking about the West just because he's handed back his military commission and he's not president yet. He's still thinking about this. And just as Britain in 1763 had the question of what to do with this all this land it had acquired the united states had that question after 1783 and i think the northwest ordinance is brilliant because one of the questions was okay so now we've won our independence and we've got access to this western land and that western land is going to be settled by american settlers what happens if American settlers take the same approach, have the same attitudes as American colonists after 1763? That is, that we were once children of the mother country, but we grew up, we became stronger, we no longer need to be governed from 3,000 miles away. What would have happened to the United States if Minnesota did that right? mm -hmm. how would you stop this western territory from becoming a series of separate republics or territories that became independent of the united states right? and the northwest ordinance i think does solves that by saying that as america expands westward it will establish territories but those territories will not be permanent in the way that British colonies will be permanent. Once they have 5,000 people, they can draw up a constitution and a system of government modeled on that of the states. Once they have 60,000 people, they can petition to join the United States on an equal footing with all the other states. And that I think is brilliant because that means that territorial status is a phase, not a permanent situation. 
And most of the states in the United States have actually come in that way. The Northwest Ordinance also looks at that territory and says, here's how we're going to settle it. It's not going to be a pell-mell rush, everybody competing and grabbing for lands and overlapping titles and bloodshed and carnage. It's going to be regulated and we'll do it almost on the model of a New England town where you'll settle one area, set, establish townships and do that uh, regularly. So, um, I mean, it divides that whole area up into sections. And as I say to my students, if you're flying over the United States or in the days when you used to be able to fly over the United yeah. States, if you look down, you can see this all laid out in squares, right? You fly over England and you look down and there's lots of walls, but it looks like the guys building the walls were all drunk because they weren't following a grid plan like this. Um, so that's a blueprint for American expansion and na na nation building. The problem is, of course, that the land, you get roughly six states out of that Northwest Territory, and then you're gonna carry that further west as, as things unfold. The land, of course, is Indian land. So the question that confronts Washington and you know the founding fathers generation is not only are what, what not only what are we going to do with the land but what are we going to do with the indian people living on the land because this is their homelands and a large uh, theme of american history i think is the transformation of indigenous homelands into american real estate how's that going to be handled yeah the Northwest Ordinance addresses this. Washington, to his credit, and Henry Knox, to his credit, struggle with this. And the Northwest Ordinance says, we will always deal honorably, justly with, with Indian people, and we will never invade their land except in just and lawful wars authorized by Congress. So let me, let me ask a simple question there. What, why, why say that? Uh, is it yeah. is it heartfelt? Is it diplomatic uh, in terms of trying to keep the peace with Native peoples? Is it looking back to Europe? What, what What's on their mind there when they say, we will act justly and honorably towards Native Americans from this point forward? It's certainly diplomatic because you're wanting to assure Indian people that when you come and send commissioners to ask them for their land, that you're doing that with their best interests at heart, not that mm -hmm. Indian people were necessarily false for the moment. It's certainly with an eye to Europe. And you ask, is it heartfelt? Mm, maybe. But I think it's too easy to dismiss. I'm, I'm convinced it's too easy, certainly, to dismiss Washington's position on this as hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. I think Washington is looking to Indian country for sure. He's also looking to Europe because his new nation is a democracy. How is that going to look on the world stage? He's very much concerned about that. He's concerned about how this will look to American citizens at the time. And he and Knox are both also concerned about how this will look to posterity. Right? History, this is, yeah. yeah right. This is an experiment. Yeah. in Republican government, and um, we've got to do better than Spain, for instance. They keep referring to how badly Spain did. Um, so I think in, when the book is ultimately, of course, critical of Washington for his Indian policy and for what happened to Indian people, but what, if there's a failure there, it's a national failure because the dilemma that Washington's struggling with is a national dilemma and Washington, I think, more than many people then, and certainly more than most people after him, really struggles with this. Is this something that you can resolve? I'm not saying that the playing field was ever 50-50. You know, mm -hmm. Shall we take their land or deal honorably with Indians? There's no question. You have to take their land if you have the vision of the nation and national expansion that Washington has. You have to take their land. but is there a way that we can do that with honor? And I think Washington eventually comes around, uh, as do other people saying, it can only be justified if Indian people get something worthwhile in return. What can we offer them in return? American civilization. Right? Because they cannot continue to live as they've lived up until now, because that would 
doom them to a backward and ultimately doomed existence but if they will embrace american style agriculture and everything else that we regard as markers of civilization then there may be a place for them in this new republic um, you can look at that and say it's torturous logic and hypocrisy but i think if you read washington's correspondence um, it's something that i think kept him up at night this is uh, remarkable. Uh, I'm, I, I want to continue the conversation, but I want to bring other voices in. So let's, uh, let's go to some questions from you uh, out in the audience uh, as, as we uh, have an opportunity to continue talking with uh, uh, Professor Calloway uh, up until 8 o'clock Eastern. Uh, uh, Bonnie, and I'm glad I mentioned the Eastern time because we are getting people from uh, other time zones. Uh, Bonnie from Fort Worth, Texas, uh, asks about uh, Washington's reputation among American Indians. So corn planter, but also others besides. Uh, how, how, what did they think of them? Yeah. And of course, one of the things that I looked for as much as I could was Native American <clears throat> expressions about Washington. Right Now, it's tricky um, because one of the, unfortunately, I was, I was aware of this, um, often Native people will give and receive names. Right? So some of the George Washingtons that I came across were not our George Washington, but were Native Americans who had taken the name George Washington or been given that name George Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> but Indian people, I guess they, it's the whole spectrum. Right? Bloody fellow, a Cherokee chief, right. comes to visit Washington in Philadelphia to sort of uh, amend a treaty. He goes home saying, that was great. Six months later, he says, Congress are liars, George Washington's a liar, William Blount is a, is a liar. Right? Other Indian people uh, at the end of the seven years French and Indian War say Washington was a disaster as a commander. He wouldn't listen to Indians. Uh, the Iroquois, whose country Washington invaded, sent armies to destroy during the revolution gave him the name the town destroyer because the American expeditions destroyed 40 Iroquois towns, burned 160,000 bushels of corn, cut down orchards. And yet, even before Washington dies, there are Indian people speaking about him in favorable terms as somebody who is trying to do them justice, if not do, do them justice. After he dies, many Indian people will say that. And that's not because they're na naive. It's not that they don't mean that, but they understand the political leverage that they have in invoking Washington's reputation. Right. The example that I <clears throat> use in the book is um, to do with the Cherokees. Because George Washington, when he, if you like, unrolls his civilization plan for Native people, um, identifies the Cherokees as his test case, says, you guys need to do this before it's too late, and you will be the role model for Indian people. And as many of you know, Cherokees uh, kind of set the pace for adopting American ways of life. They adopt American-style agriculture, send their kids to school, adopt a written language, they have their own syllabary, uh, adopt a, a written language and newspaper, a constitution modeled on the United States, and they then get kick, kicked out along the Trail of Tears after the Indian Removal Act of 1830, where Congress basically answered that, <clears throat> that question that Washington wrestled with, will there be a place for Indians in the United States, Eastern Mississippi, Congress in 1830 says, nope. Um, so the Cherokees of all people would have good reason to point to Washington and say he was a liar, he deceived us. Right? John Ross, who was the principal chief of the Cherokees at the time of the Trail of Tears and whose wife died on the Trail of Tears, um, named one of his sons George Washington. Right? And so mm -hmm. I think I like that because it kind of gets at the complexity of this relationship. Fascinating. Well, let's let's stay on the on, on, on a related subject. Uh, Adam asked a question about uh, um, whether Washington was manipulated into quote unquote starting the Seven Years' War. I think you mentioned that he's often 
uh, described as having started the war uh, because they needed the support of the British to cement their control of the Northeast. Um, this puts the uh, the real uh, action on the on the in, in Native Americans. They're not pawns. They're maybe um, working both. Uh, could you uh, uh, speak to this point? Yeah, thank you, Adam. This is the great question. It's kind of the question in, in some ways. And it's quite complicated. I mean, in, the short answer is yes, um, but I'm a Dartmouth professor. So there's a big but, and then there's a long <laughs> half hour. <laughs> so, um, because what's happening is that the half, the position of half king is kind of um, a vital intermediary, right? He represents the Iroquois to the Shawnees and the Delawares. He represents the Iroquois to the French. He represents the Iroquois to the, the British. What the French have done by essentially invading, invading that country and establishing a military presence is jeopardize that balance. As long as that balance is there, he's a really important guy. Right? Once that balance is disrupted, once the French are in control, he's not so important anymore. And the Iroquois policy from 1700 onwards is to try and remain neutral, officially neutral in disputes between the British and the French. So Tanarison is not only trying to get the British to go to war with the French, to kind of stem or kick the French out and restore that balance. He's also trying to get the Iroquois to abandon that position of neutrality vis-a-vis -vis the French, and he's also trying to get the Delawares and Shawnees to take up arms against the French. And so he wants a fighting war to start out, to break out with the French. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's no way that Washington can know all this. And he he's a kid dealing with this seasoned player. He's not only a seasoned warrior, but a seasoned practicer, practitioner, of the world of Indian policy. And you know, frankly, Tanarison's leaving leading on. Yeah, there's an expedition of French guys coming. They're coming to get you. Actually, it seems the weight of evidence is that Jumonville is coming with the same purpose that Washington had when Dinwiddie sent him on an on a mission to ask the French to leave. He's asked he's coming to ask the British to leave. Right. Hmm. And when Washington gets sucked into that skirmish. Uh, and French soldiers are killed and French soldiers are wounded. Jumonville is one of those wounded, according to several of accounts of survivors and deserters. Jumonville pulls out that document and, and, and starts to speak. Um, and of course, he's speaking in French. And Washington doesn't speak French. Tanarison does. So Tanarison comes up to him and sinks his hatchet in, into his head. Basically mm -hmm. says, "Thou art not dead yet, my father." Now here's a you know fifty year old warrior chief talking to a you know green lieutenant, probably a, maybe a you know young guy. Why is he calling him that, uh, my father? Because he's addressing not this lieutenant, not this ensign, but the governor of Quebec, right? Who, in the ritual language of diplomacy, is addressed by the Iroquois as father. So when he's saying thou art not dead yet, my father, he's talking not only about this guy, this uh, mortally wounded person, he's also talking about this alliance and by sinking his hatchet into his head and then significantly sending war axes and wampum belts to the tribes, he's shattering that alliance. So he thinks. The problem is that the Shawnees and Delawares don't go along with it. So, well, I'm not so sure. And they wow. finish up actually siding with the French. So it, it it's Tanarison's gamble and it doesn't pay off. Um, but it's a, it's a yeah, very yeah. complex, mos not a more, it's a moving mosaic. It's a kaleidoscope. And wow. so when I'm critical of Washington saying he doesn't know what's going on, who the hell could have known what was going on, you know, from right. that, with that experience and that background? Well, I'm just glad Adam asked that question. That's that's a fascinating uh, window into the early moments of the war. Yeah. Uh, what's uh, uh, um, you mentioned Washington not speaking French, um, which we know uh, he he did buy a dictionary a time or two, wanted to try yeah. to grapple with French, never quite got there. Uh, what do we know about his uh, ability to understand any native languages uh, or any interest yeah. in that area? 
Not that I know of, and even at interest is a good question because as we know, Thomas Jefferson was fascinated by Indian languages, mm -hmm. right? Um, I don't see any of that fascination with Washington. He's got to have picked up phrases, key terms, etc., and things like that. Um, but Indian diplomacy, and of course, this is another aspect of it, um, it's not only conducted by wampum belts, it's conducted through interpreters. Hmm. So you have interpreters who are not only interpreting languages, but interpreting wampum belts as well. Right. And so, you know, with the best of intentions, this is a difficult sort of communication. But yeah, Washington's in Indian diplomacy is conducted through one or more interpreters. Right? Um, and that's a complex issue in itself because sometimes Indian diplomats who can speak English, when they are in treaty negotiations or come to Philadelphia, insist on speaking their own languages. Right? It's a, mm. um, I think it's, you know, I, I, I've sometimes seen that at formal gatherings at, at Dartmouth where a native visitor will speak in their own language first. Uh, it's a, it's kind of a, an assertion of sovereignty. Right? This yeah. is my first language, um, and now we'll speak English. Well, sometimes they, I mean, there's a prominent Delaware chief by the name of Tidiuskan before Washington's time who always insisted on uh, he could speak English, but in treaties he always insisted in speaking Delaware and having the English go through the interpretation groups. Fascinating. Yeah, I, as, as you know, I taught at the University of Oklahoma for several years, and yeah. I, I had similar encounters where uh, in a formal occasion uh, the, the, it would begin in a native language and then shift Absolutely. over. Yeah. Um, uh, let's uh, um, go to another question, uh, and we have one coming in uh, from Andy uh, about uh, the question. You mentioned learning um, to farm and to act in, in uh, ways that Washington would have recognized as civilized. Uh, what did Washington think about the ultimate possibility of that for yeah. American Indians? And of course, one of the things we um, recognize today, I think, is that <clears throat> assimilation in the way that Washington and Jefferson, these guys thought about it, was in fact a form of extinction. Right? Um, <clears throat> that, I mean, genocide is a very problematic term, but it has several definitions, um, many of which go beyond actually physically destruction of people. You can com commit genocide on people by destroying their culture. And the Washingtonian Jeffersonian view of, a, of survival for Indian people was you can survive by becoming like us. If you don't become like us, you're doomed to extinction. <clears throat> you cannot continue to live as a hunting uh, society. Not that they ever were a hunting society, they were agricultural societies. But of course, for Washington and Jefferson, the wrong people were doing the farming. Indian women were doing the farming. You couldn't have that. You had to have the guys doing the farming. But <clears throat> if you alter the society so much that it becomes indistinguishable, then that was the goal of assimilation. But then in some ways, you've obtained the, that same goal of getting rid of Indians. Right? Now, Washington to give him his due, sees this as a <clears throat> um, a path to survival um, or an opportunity, maybe the only opportunity. Believing as he believed, committed as he was to national expansion, only if Indians took this path could they have a chance. I don't think Washington ever really thought that Indian nations could survive in the United States holding land communally and all of that, because that was the antithesis of the <clears throat> Washington's view of the nation. But Indian people living on individual farms, living like American farmers, I, I think he believed that. And some Indian people, corn planter, little turtle, Indian people who'd fought tooth and nail against the Americans, come around to, to that way of thinking as a possibility, and as maybe the only possibility. Um, and of mm -hmm. course, one of the things that Washington and American policymakers underestimate 
from that time forward is the cultural resilience of Native American society uh, and the ways in which <coughs> Native American communities and individuals find to continue to be Native American, even as, if you like, surface way of ways of life change over time. But it's a very uh, uh, complex issue and it's at the heart, I think, of uh, relationships between the United States, between American society and uh, Native American societies. Great. Uh, it's, a, a, it's an interesting uh, question then, an interesting question now in all kinds of ways, as you mentioned, the ongoing resilience of, of, of Native communities today. Uh, we have another question that's come in uh, from Jay, and I, I believe it's uh, uh, something that, that you've written about, uh, too, um, and this... Uh, uh, I'll just go ahead and read this. The Indian War in Ohio led to one of the first national scandals of the Washington administration, uh, including the first ever invocation of executive privilege against a congressional subpoena. Uh, could you discuss some of these early defeats? And he mentions two there. Um, uh, Sinclair's defeat is, is uh, 1791. I think the other is in 1790, but you tell me. Uh, shaped the Washington presidency and ultimately American history. Uh, this is something we haven't yet talked about, you and I, and that is the military struggles of Washington's presidency with Native peoples. Yes, thank you, Jay, and audience. Um, I did not plant Jay in the audience to ask that question. Because um, <laughs> I've written a book about Sinclair's defeat. It's actually a smaller book that I wrote. It kind of got me into the Washington book in some ways. And the reason I wrote that book was, as a Native American historian, one of the things, obviously, that we continually are up against is the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Custer's Last Stand, whatever you call it, which, about which there are hundreds of books, movies, et cetera, et cetera. This for a battle in which roughly 250 American soldiers were killed and it slowed American expansion, not at all. In St. Clair's defeat in November 4th, 1791, <clears throat> the United Indian Confederacy of the Northwest Territory, who were resisting American expansion into that area, destroyed the only army the United States had. Um, killed 632, hundreds wounded, hundreds taken into captivity. Essentially, the only American army in existence ceased to exist. Thomas Jefferson said when the news reached Philadelphia, nobody talked about anything else. Hmm. Because this is 1791, right? Two years after the Constitution. This is not only an embarrassing defeat, this threatens the existence of the nation because these Indian nations are still clearly powerful. Spain is still causing trouble in the south and southwest. Britain is doing the same in the north, just waiting in many ways for this experiment in republicanism to fail. And Washington, it, there's a number of aspects to this, right? This is almost like a carbon copy of the destruction of Braddock's army by an Indian, <clears throat> United Indian force in 1755. And it's often said that Washington learned from the Seven Years' War how to fight Indians and he used those tactics against the British and won. Um, well, Washington sends St. Clair out against Indian country basically to do the same thing, destroy the the villages and the same thing happens when that happens of course all hell breaks loose who's responsible for this etc and this was a a campaign that had been marked by marred and marked by contractor fraud and corruption right from the get-go a lot of those guys who died were ill-prepared ill-equipped ill-trained you know they were like you know sheep to the slaughter but Many people uh, in Congress said, okay, we want to get to the bottom of this. Right? And of course, one of the things to do that is to follow the money, right? Where is this trail going to lead? Well, they knew pretty well where it was going to lead. The Secretary of the Treasury, who's Alexander Hamilton, whom lots of people hate, right? This was long before the musical, right? Now he's a star. People were out to get him. <clears throat> and so, the first Congressional Investigation Committee is established. And they submit a request to Washington 
to the executive for documentation. And Washington as first president realizes this is gonna set precedent. And so he huddles with his cabinet, says, what do we do? And the cabinet says, you've got to hand over the documents. But you can insist on keeping back any documents that you feel would be, if you, the, the release of which you feel would be detrimental to the public interest, right? Hmm. We now know what that's called ever since Watergate and in our own lifetime. This is executive privilege, but that's where it where it comes from, right? Fascinating. Um, as I, you know, getting back to my opening, how do we get Indians into American history in a meaningful way? Just pick a spot, right? They're there. Yeah. 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 Well, I, now that now that we've talked a little bit about uh, war in Washington's presidency, I do want to go back to the where we started with this this question of diplomacy. Uh, there was another uh, Indian person that you were describing to me uh, in our conversation before we came on, uh, a member of the Creek Nation, yeah. uh, and I, I believe we have his image. And I'd love to to show it, uh, but uh, I, I want to uh, tell us about this person and Washington's relationships. Uh, that he would have formed with uh, all of these delegations that are coming to speak with him. Uh, who are we looking at here? This is a, a Creek chief, <clears throat> a Lower Creek chief by the name of Hapotli Miko. He's often known in English as the Talasi King. He's actually a rival of the most dominant Creek chief at the time, who is whose name is Alexander McGillivray. And as you might expect with a name like that, he had a Scottish father. Creek mother. Uh, so he's Creek because he gets his clan membership through the maternal line. There are a lot of Scottish traders intermarried in Creek and Cherokee society. Why does Washington you know, want to meet these guys? Well, the Creek Confederacy after the revolution was a major power in the Southeast courted by the British, Spain and the United States. It's a loose confederacy of about 50 semi-autonomous towns stretching from northern Florida to Mississippi. But together, if they could ever get it together, um, which was sort of contrary to their political system, but they could muster about 5,000 warriors. As Henry Knox reminded George Washington at the time, the United States Army has consisted of 500 men, right? Hmm. So you need not to go to war with these people, not only because they outnumber you, but because they are so heavily courted by Spain that if you go to war with them, you're gonna have an international conflict. It's not that Washington and the United States are planning to go to the war with the Creek. It, the problem is that Georgia is encroaching on Creek lands to such an extent that this war is likely to explode, which reminds us, of course, that it was never a given that the United States, as we know it, was going to come to fruition. Even after independence, a lot of the states were determined to maintain their independence and their states' rights. And we're accustomed to think of states' rights in terms of slavery, but early on, it's very much to do with Indian land. Washington wants to make a treaty with the Creeks to try and establish an alliance, to try and prevent that worst case scenario from developing. And so he invites uh, Alexander McGillivray and a delegation of Creeks to come to New York. Right? He sends delegations to a Creek country that don't work out and he invites them essentially on a state visit. And they travel overland from Georgia, stopping in towns in Virginia, in Baltimore, Philadelphia, they're fitted and dined along the way, and then arrive in New York. And there's the biggest turnout of crowds to see the Creeks since Washington's inauguration, right? This is a huge deal. And this is the first treaty that the United States makes after signing the constitution, the first treaty with anybody. Uh, and it's celebrated with a huge event at, at Federal Hall uh, and Washington gets the treaty. It's, it's an interesting treaty because there's the public official treaty that Hapothli Miko and the other 20 plus Creek delegates sign. And then there are secret articles to the treaty 
made just with Alexander McGillivray. When you mm -hmm. read the Treaty of New York, you think, why would the Creeks give up land which a year or two earlier they were adamantly refusing to give up? The answer lies in the secret articles. Wow. Uh, it's essentially a series of bribes to uh, McGillivray. But McGillivray goes back to Spain and gets a better offer anyway and, and reneges, renounces the, the treaty. But this is a, I love this portrait because um, <clears throat> it not only shows Hippothlamico, but notice he's wearing an American uniform. They gave the prominent Creek uh, chiefs American military uniforms uh, as part of the celebration of this, this great treaty. Well, it's it's also a, 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 a wonderful John Trumbull sketch that's included in your book, uh, and I want to mention that the uh, uh, this is uh, obviously we're talking about uh, not just any book, but uh, the winner of last year's George Washington Prize. Uh, congratulations again, Colin. Uh, so you. this is highly recommended uh, in in every possible way. Uh, to purchase a copy, uh, you can actually contact our own uh, shops in Mount Vernon, uh, which are still uh, happy and, and, and eager to serve you uh, and deliver things to your home. Uh, this is a, a wonderful book and a great uh, conversation. We have one more question coming in uh, from Cynthia, and I want to uh, let her have the, the last question here. Um, uh, did Washington keep notes uh, about his dealings with Native peoples, whether in the 1750s or in the 1790s? Um, uh, how, what sort of materials were you able to draw from in Washington's own papers? And was there a particular story that stood out uh, from Washington's accounts, his own writings about these encounters? Mm. Yeah, thank you, Cindy, Cynthia. Um, because I remember at one point when I was starting out on this book, somebody said, do you think you'll have enough information? Well, one of the reasons I was able to do, do the book is because of the great work done by the people who've been editing the papers of George Washington for, you know, I guess forever. Since so um, 1968, yeah, it's been right. going on a while. That's yeah. right. Tremendous work. And of course, those um, papers are not only published in hard copy, but they're digitized and accessible online. Um, so anybody can look at them. Um, and Nobody, I think, can look at those. If you go through those papers looking for Indians, nobody can go through there and say that Washington was not interested in Indians. Right? He talks about them a lot. Um, some people say that um, somebody else's estimate, I'm not sure who I'm citing here, is saying that the cabinet talked about Indians more than anything else. Five-sixths of the national budget goes on Indians, etc. Washington does talk about Indians a lot refers to Indians a lot, but primarily in the context of Indian land or Indian treaties or political relations with Indians or wars against Indians, um, much less interested in Indian culture. Um, there is, a, as I mentioned in the book, and as Roger Kennedy, I think it was, points out in his book on uh, a lost cities where he's interested in Indian mound civilizations. Mm -hmm. There's a point where Washington is actually in an area of the Ohio Valley where there are Indian mounds everywhere, right? Surely he described what he was seeing, but as Roger Kennedy points out, his journals on that at that point seem to have been eaten by mice or bugs or something. So even, uh, you know, we just don't know. But yeah. I actually think had he done that, it would have been out of character because when Washington was in those places, you know, in the Ohio Valley, he's less inter interested in uh, tangible reminders or physical remains of Native American civilizations than he is in the fertility of the bot bottom lands, right? This is going to be good land. This is going to be good agricultural land. Yeah. He looks at Indian, he looks at America with a surveyor's gaze. And I think that actually blinkers him from seeing other aspects of Indian country. Um, so when I think about what, what stands out from Washington's writings about him, there's two I'd say. One is I think I was quite surprised at how much he struggles with trying to do the right thing as he sees it with it for Indian people 
once he's president. Mm -hmm. The other is, though, the meticulous preparation that he put in to Sullivan's expedition into Iroquois country. It's an expedition I knew a lot about because I knew of it. I'd read the journals of the officers who went on it, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but I'd always called it Sullivan's expedition. By yeah. the time I'd finished reading Washington's papers and Washington's correspondence with Sullivan and other people, I'm inclined to call it Washington's expedition. Wow. He micromanages it. He wants this to succeed. This has to succeed. He's doing questionnaires to frontiersmen and traders, uh, to generals. He wants to know where the Iroquois villages are, how you get to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This has to be a success. And to sound like a broken record, I suspect, that's not just because he's sending an expedition to retaliate for Iroquois attacks on the American frontier. He's also laying claim to those lands so that when the war is finished, the United States will have a claim to those lands at the peace talks, right? My wife grew up on a farm in Vermont where she says, you know, that every spring they harvest, harvested rocks, first of all. Iroquois country is the Finger Lakes district of New York, right? This mm -hmm. is some of the richest, deepest topsoil there is. Um, this has to become American. And Washington understood what we can't understand because we know how the revolution finished with Britain transferring all that land to the United States. There was no guarantee that the Brits were going to do that. And in fact, there were conversations going on towards the end of the war that maybe a peace could nego be negotiated on the basis of a kind of status quo. Yeah, the United States will get its independence, but people will hold things as they were. And, and so if Britain kept land west of the Appalachian Trail uh, chain or kept land you know, claimed by the Quebec Act, that's a huge amount of Indian country that Washington is banking on the United States getting. Uh, so I think all of that is wrapped up in that correspondence. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Um, I, I'm so glad, uh, and I know everyone at Mount Vernon and everyone who cares about uh, uh, George Washington's history and, and Native American studies and American history are, are glad that you brought all of these elements together. Uh, and, and, and thank you for taking an hour uh, uh, to talk to us about this. Uh, I know you've come to Mount Vernon and, and uh, formally presented on this. Uh, so uh, during our, our closure, we, we were excited to, uh, to bring you back uh, for a conversation about this book uh, so that we could reach out to people in their homes as uh, everyone stays uh, safe and, and hunkered down. So thank you so much, Colin. I, I'm so grateful. And everyone watching, uh, thank you for spending time with us. I hope you've learned something. I hope that you continue to stay engaged with uh, what Mount Vernon is uh, bringing out to you uh, and continue to support Mount Vernon. We care about what we do. Uh, I know that uh, we will, uh, from now through, uh, through the end of the year, through the end of next year, we will continue to be bringing things uh, to you. Uh, someday we'll be able to do it again at Mount Mount Vernon, uh, but between now and then, continue to support Mount Vernon. Uh, please consider donating um, if you haven't already. Uh, become a member. Join us for our Monday uh, broadcast, member exclusives. Uh, and uh, if you haven't already read the book, uh, go buy this book and uh, and take a close look. Thank you so much, Colin, and to everyone. Good night. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.